Welcome, folks. We'll get started in uh, just a few minutes. We want to give everybody a chance to log into the webinar. We'll be utilizing the um, Q&A function today. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and enter it into the Q&A um, rather than the chat box. All right, we're going to give just another minute um, and then we will be recording this and sending the recording out to everyone who has registered. Um, we'll also be streaming this webinar on Facebook Live. Uh, so if you log on to Facebook and go to our Facebook page, you can see the recording there as well as uh, when we send it out to you via email. So I'm going to go ahead and um, get us set up streaming. And then we will go ahead and have Susan get started. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Welcome. Welcome today. Um, I just want to go ahead and get a chance to introduce our presenter for today. Um, she is Susan Griffith. I apologize. Our Florida Friendly Landscaping Coordinator. And I'm going to let her go ahead and get started. <laughs> Hi. One of the uh, complications of working from home, <laughs> we have lives and we have children and pets sometimes. So Yes. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us today. I am Susan Griffith and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Coordinator here at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Manatee. And a lot of people sometimes wonder, well, what is the point of a rain barrel? Um, because rain barrels only collect rain when it's raining and your plants are being watered while it's raining. Well, I think that our weather recently is showing us that the reason why rain barrels are good. Because remember two weeks ago, it rained for about two weeks solid. And since then, it would have been in a drought again. So we're actually able to use that water that we collected in our rain barrels when it rained two weeks ago. And now we're able to water our plants through this dry period. So, so there's the answer to that. 
Here are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. We'll go through these real fast um, and you'll see that some of these definitely apply directly to our topic today. Um, nine principles. Number one is right plant, right place. If you put the right plant in the right place, everything's downhill from there. Um, watering efficiently. And obviously that relates to today's topic. Fertilizing appropriately. Um, that actually relates to runoff, which is one thing we're going to address today. Um, stormwater runoff and pollution, um, mulch, attracting wildlife. Um, number six is managing yard pests responsibly. Number seven, in this case, um, recycling is water. We're recycling rainwater when we use rain barrels. And number eight is reducing stormwater runoff. And number nine is protecting the waterfront. Again, we're protecting the waterfront from runoff and pollution. So what exactly is stormwater runoff? It is water that runs off of impervious surfaces or water saturated surfaces, which then transports sediments and dissolved chemicals into nearby waters. And of course, increased urbanization leads to an increased amount of stormwater runoff. Um, back many, many years ago, before all of this development that's taking place in Florida, we had a lot more natural areas, right? So um, there was a lot more opportunity for that water to, to be back, uh, reabsorbed basically back um, down into the aquifer. So soil and plant roots absorb a lot of this rainwater, um, but that increased urbanization leads to the development of all of these impervious services everywhere, all these roads, all these sidewalks. So this all results in a lot of water running off into um, storm drains, carrying lots of pollutants with it. So um, most storm water um, is not filtered. So it just leads directly to water bodies with zero treatment whatsoever. And of course, polluted runoff is among the top water quality issues in the state of Florida. And Florida really possesses a, a huge amount of water-related resources. That's what we're known for. That's why people come here. Um, we have 2,276 miles of shoreline. We have 663 miles of coastal beaches. We have over 7,700 freshwater lakes and between 750 and 800 springs in Florida. So it's, it's a huge draw for, for people to, to visit us. Um, and our aquifer system, where most uh, municipalities actually get most of their drinking water, um, the aquifers are underground rock and cave systems that hold water and all that limestone that sits below us. And it's called the Floridan Aquifer. Uh, note that it's not Floridian, um, but Floridan. And the, aqua the water table is the upper zone of the aquifer. So if you've ever been digging a hole to plant plants um, and you've reached water, you have actually reached the upper zone of the aquifer. You've reached the water table. And it is, as I said, the main source of drinking water for, for most counties in Florida. And of course, the health of our groundwaters is directly related to our surface waters. And this is a really frightening example of what surface waters can sometimes actually look like. This is an actual picture, randomly taken here in an industrial area. So stormwater runs off into surface waters, which are connected uh, to the aquifer via springs, basins, and sinkholes, et cetera. And it's helpful to keep in mind when we think about water that all water sources are connected even well water. So a lot of people think, you know, that they're, they're off the grid basically if they are using well water, but no, it's all connected. So if, if the water um, is polluted in the aquifer, that's, that's where that water is coming from too. And obviously polluted water negatively impacts our health. And nobody would want to come to Florida as a tourist if the water all looked like that. 
So we want to make sure that our water keeps on looking as clear as possible um, because water is Florida's lifeblood and tourism is our largest industry in every other year besides this one. <laughs> um, and of course the fishing industry is huge in Florida. And of course, any kind of decreases in natural ecosystems in Florida will end up being uh, translated into decreased dollars in, from tourism. So there's a lot of great economic concerns with keeping our water clean. And tourism does account for $67 billion in annual revenue for our state, $22 billion in beaches alone, and $6 billion in fishing alone. And of course, water is by far our most precious natural resource. We literally cannot live without water. 95% uh, of Florida's drinking water comes from groundwater sources. Groundwater is highly vulnerable to contamination. Um, some of those possible contaminants would be fertilizer and pesticide runoff from millions of yards and agricultural use, um, pet waste improperly disposed of, uh, oil, gas, and chemical pollution from automobiles and or industry. And of course, our large scale industrial and sewage spills that happen way too often as well in Florida. So one thing that we all can do to help reduce our water quality is to fertilize appropriately. And in many cases, that means reducing the amount of fertilizer that we're using. Um, sometimes fertilizer is used uh, in quantities way too high and way too frequently than is necessary. So um, it's a good idea to attain a soil test um, prior to fertilization to see where you're at. Um, you can do that through us and send off a sample to the University of Florida. Um, you'd have to pay for shipping and for the cost of the test, um, but you can call us for details. Um, follow printed directions on your fertilizer bag. The label is the law. And you definitely never want to apply fertilizer or pesticides before a rainfall. If you know that a rainfall is imminent, definitely do not apply fertilizer. Um, excess nutrients can definitely run off into waterways and leach into groundwater. And you want to obey our county fertilizer ordinance. Um, we have a ban on phosphorus, which is the middle number on a bag of fertilizer. Um, you, you'll see there's always those three numbers, your NPK numbers on a bag of fertilizer. So you want to go for that zero middle number um, all during the year here in Florida. Well, at least in Manta County where we have the ordinance in effect. And also um, throughout the, the entire rainy season, um, it's starting on uh, June 1st and continuing through October 31st. That's our ordinance period. Uh, where you are prohibited from using any sort of nitrogen fertilizer whatsoever uh, during that period. And of course, that is to try to combat our uh, unfortunate al algae situations that we have. And of course, utilizing shrubs and ground covers can also help to filter our stormwater as well. So. Um, this is a definite uh, reason to uh, attract some, or I'm sorry, <laughs> to introduce <laughs> some native plants into your yard, like this beautiful muley grass pictured here and our, our beautiful blanket flower. Um, it helps to slow the speed of water movement. So that also helps to reduce runoff. It helps to reduce erosion and it also helps to insulate the soil and of course uptake nutrients and provide habitat and food and cover for wildlife. So the conventional wisdom always used to be, um, you know, years and years ago, um, you wanted to try to get the water, <clears throat> excuse me, off of your property. So <clears throat> our, our aging in, in infrastructure for stormwater was really kind of based on that principle and everything was sort of all of your downspouts and and on houses were directed on to um, you know driveways and, and things like that and the whole idea was to just get it off of your property well 
that was a long time ago and and research has shown us that a lot of our pollution problems are due to all of this runoff that's coming off of all of our individual collective properties so um, really uh, what that has told us is that we need to try to retain as much of of that stormwater runoff on our own properties as much as possible to try to let it percolate through that helps to to filter that water, filter those pollutants out of it, and, and keep it from going into these other water bodies where it can contaminate all of our drinking water. So um, utilizing porous surfaces for walkways and patios and driveways, pavers are, are good for that if possible. Um, and just always make sure that you're directing your downspouts and gutters um, to landscape areas and turf where it can it can percolate and filter. Here are some examples of what not to do. These are the old school setups here um, back when we didn't know any better but unfortunately a lot of our houses are, are older homes and they may still be set up this way uh, to have the downspouts going right on to um, these impervious um, hard surfaces where it becomes stormwater runoff. So uh, if you have a situation like this, it's, it's a simple matter to change that around and fix that problem. Um, you definitely don't wanna have your, your storm drain downspouts going onto surfaces like this. Um, this is a good example. Um, and this is another good example of how you can add attachments and redirect that water into um, good areas where it should be going. And here's some examples of, of some more um, pervious surfaces that will allow water to, to filter through it rather than having just plain concrete walkways. And other ways to reduce that stormwater runoff, uh, rain gardens are another great example. These work really well, um, especially for people who have a naturally low spot in their yard anyway. Um, you can just add some plants that can tolerate those conditions and um, you can really mitigate a lot of stormwater runoff that way as well. But that's not today's topic. Today's topic are rain barrels. So I want to note here that a lot of people are, are apprehensive about trying to bring a rain barrel home because they're afraid their HOA will tell them no. Well, HOAs really cannot prevent you from having them. They are an accepted element of the Florida Friendly Landscaping legislation, so your HOA really can't prevent you from putting one in, but they can, however, tell you where you can place it. And of course, this is usually in the backyard. So um, that may be a concession that you'll have to make in order to have your rain barrel, but that's fine. Um, so, oops, sorry. So what is a rain barrel exactly? Uh, a rain barrel is a recycled food grade barrel used to capture and hold rainwater. And the food grade part is very important. You don't want to have one that once held dangerous chemicals. Um, and there may be some out there on the market, um, you know, if you go onto Craigslist or eBay or something like that, you may not necessarily know what you're getting. So I, I do wanna caution you about that, that um, not just any, any recycled barrel will necessarily do for you. You really need that, that assurance that it was only used for food grade um, chemicals or products. So you don't necessarily need to have it attached to your house. You can think outside of the box with the placement of your rain barrel. This is one of our master gardeners, I believe, who built this very elaborate structure here to house his firewood and he hooked up a gutter system to it and that's where he put his rain barrel. Um, so what are some of the advantages of using a rain barrel? It will reduce the use of potable water uh, to use on your landscape plants. Um, it reduces erosion and can help prevent standing water in your yard. It obviously reduces your stormwater runoff and it can potentially save you money. A lot of money really. Um, our annual rainfall in Manatee County is an average of 52 inches so that's pretty significant and when you do the rainfall math with that 
one inch of rainfall over a 1,000 square foot roof produces 625 gallons of water. So that's just one rain event. Just one rain event producing one inch of water or one inch of rainfall, 625 gallons. So um, that's equivalent to about 12 rain barrels. Um, and so in theory, if you had 12 rain barrels, you could potentially save 32,500 gallons of water a year. Obviously, when we think about how much water is coming off of our roofs, multiple barrels might be a good idea if that's feasible for you. Um, they can be attached together and placed, you know, placed like this, hooked up together, um, or they can be done separately at different corners of the home. That's another option. Uh, I just want to point out here that these guys look really shaky here and you never want to have really sketchy non-level rain barrels. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but um, notice the difference. This is obviously very stable. All of these situations are very stable. That one looks very scary. <laughs> okay, so if you are going to be using multiple barrels, uh, more than one, um, here are some different ways that you can do it. A uh, high joining of the barrels allows one barrel to fill at a time and drain one barrel at a time. So the barrels will be uneven unless they are tapped separately. So really that is better to use two spigots with that system if you're gonna do that. Now the low joining of the barrels allows both barrels to fill at the same time and drain both barrels simultaneously. So, um, or you can do one spigot um, and it'll, it'll still work that way too. And just a brief mention to, um, to everyone about the idea of possibly using a cistern as well. Um, if you want to get really serious about this, um, cisterns are a good option. Um, this one is actually at the Gamble Mansion in uh, Parrish, and, or Ellington rather, um, and Obviously, this is not new technology. This is very, very old. This is Civil War era here, uh, or older, really. Um, and that was really how they got their water back then. That was their only way to get water. And actually, uh, there are some barrier islands that still utilize cisterns as their only water source. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, but of course, they have their complications. Okay, so items to consider prior to installing your rain barrel. You wanna think about your placement and how you're going to be connecting your barrel or barrels. Um, how are you gonna deal with your overflow? Because there definitely will be if you're getting 625 gallons off of your roof and you only have two barrels, you're gonna have overflow. Um, painting your rain barrel and some safety considerations. Now here's an example where someone had a downspout that was really, even though it wasn't um, facing the, the more impervious surface, it was still way too close to the home. So it caused erosion like right at the foundation of the home, which was not good. And now that's not going to be a suitable location until they correct um, the unlevel the situation going on here. So um, they have to fix that where that erosion occurred and make that level and then possibly that could be a location for the for the rain barrel. Um, you definitely need to elevate your rain barrel because rain barrel water is fed by gravity. So the higher the stand the greater pressure you'll get. There are some people I've run across just recently that are um, actually making their own pumps using marine batteries or photovoltaics um, but those are the really handy folks. <laughs> That's not me for sure. Uh, so most people opt out um, and just use gravity and create a stand. Uh, if you have tools and enjoy working with wood, you may opt to build a wooden stand. And of course, remember that this will need more maintenance. It will need to be painted or stained and then probably kept up with you know, as often as needed, possibly once a year, it will need to be repainted or restained. And if that's too much work, and if you're not good with carpentry, then cinder blocks are the easiest, really the easiest way to go with it. 
Um, they're easy to construct, are very stable and very long lasting, and virtually no maintenance is involved if you use cinder blocks as your stand. Um, they are not nearly as attractive, of course, as wooden stands, so that's a consideration if that really matters to you. Uh, they have to be sturdy. Whatever they are, they have to be sturdy. Water weighs about 8.35 pounds per gallon. So typical rain barrels are 55 gallons. So when that's full, that's over 450 pounds. And when you're talking especially uh, about using multiple barrels on a stand, that can be really heavy. It looks like this was constructed I, you know, eventually to hold four barrels. So um, four full barrels on there would be 1800 pounds. So if you look at the detail on this, um, they were not messing around when they put that together. That's really well constructed. So you need to keep that in mind that you, you definitely need to build, if you're using wood, you need to build it, you know, for this weight. It's quite, quite heavy. And of course, remember that the ground beneath it must be very, very firm, very, very level. Um, concrete pads might be a good idea or large stepping stones um, once the ground is level to, to place your stand on. Um, the concrete uh, can be very, you know, very sturdy. And to me, that's hitting the easy button on this. <laughs> that's definitely what I did for my rain barrel. Um, these are very inexpensive and it's very easy to um, pick them up and throw them together like this. And it's very, very stable. So you wanna make sure that you buy enough that it's uh, a larger base than the barrel diameter so that you don't have any kind of tipsiness going on there. Um, and here's, uh, another example of that really precarious looking crooky one um, and here someone has they looked like they were getting off to a good start with cinder blocks but then they threw in some random pieces of wood and cement here so you don't want to do that <laughs> that that definitely looks a little sketchy so uh, falling on on children and pets is really a concern you know you don't want this thing to fall on your kids and your pets so really you have to make sure that it's really really stable and it can be secured to the wall with heavy duty straps and hardware it, um, for extra security and your long-term maintenance is also something to think about so they actually do make uh, these nice little handy filtration system things that you can install at the top of your gutter um, so that it catches anything that might go down that downspout so it doesn't go into your rain barrel. Keep in mind that probably mosquitoes could still get through something like this, definitely through this. So you know how mosquitoes are always on the lookout for any kind of water to lay their eggs in. So um, I would not trust this as a means to keep mosquitoes out and we'll talk about that in a minute. Too. There is a, a thing, a little trick you can do to keep those out. And this is, of course, a DIY option um, that's made out of a nursery plant pot with the bottom cut out and some window screen and some chicken wire. It's not as pretty, but it would definitely work in a pinch. There are multiple ways to set up your rain barrel. Um, I have seen many, many different methods for this, and it's really kind of you know, it's up to you how, how you feel comfortable with doing it. Some people use one of the holes that are already drilled in the top of the rain barrel. Um, it, it basically it comes with two holes and it comes with um, plugs and you can take out one of those plugs and keep the other one plugged and, and use that um, as your water intake or you can flip the barrel over and use one of those holes for your bottom spigot. In a case like that, then you would be drilling a hole in the top, or what was the, what would be the bottom, what was the bottom that's now the top. <laughs> so the bottom of the barrel, um, you would be drilling a, a hole with a hole saw as your water intake then. So it can be done either way. Um, there's no wrong or right way to really, it's very flexible. But either way, you will definitely need a power drill and saw attachments. 
So if you get your rain barrel from the county um, or eventually from us down the road, we don't have any right now, um, but the county, um, I spoke with them and they're back to selling them. So I'll have their information at the end. Um, it will come with some basic parts, but you will probably need some other items to complete your installation. Um, you're probably going to need additional flexible parts here um, that you'll be attaching once you end up cutting your downspout. The flexibility here really does help, let me tell you. Um, if you go with the rigid ones, it can sometimes be more frustration than it's worth. So um, they do make flexible ones and that's, to me, in my opinion, that's the way to go. Um, you may require PVC bulkheads, if, especially if you are going to be installing your, your bottom spigot um, using the existing holes. So if you're gonna be flipping that barrel upside down and using those existing holes, you're gonna need that large diameter bulkhead um, for your spigot operation. And of course, depending on your plans, if, especially if you're gonna be hooking multiple barrels up together, you're gonna to need definitely more assorted PVC, PVC parts for attaching them together than what the county is gonna provide you with. So just a heads up on that. Um, get it first, see what you've got, and then go from there. Um, most likely though, you're gonna be needing to make at least one, if not multiple trips to the hardware store. I can tell you from personal experience of trying to be handy that it almost is, uh, almost always is more than one trip to the hardware store. I'm sure a lot of you feel me on that. Okay, you will need a power drill for sure, whether that's electric uh, or whether that's corded electric or cordless. Um, you're going to need uh, a hole saw and like a three and three quarter inch hole saw. Um, if you're going to be doing your water intake at the former bottom um, for your, that's now going to be your top of your barrel. If you're going to be drilling a hole on the side near the bottom of, for the spigot, you will need a one inch hole saw that looks something like this. Um, you're going to need Teflon tape that may or may not come in your, your packet that you get from the county. You're definitely going to need some waterproof PVC cement. That is something that will not come in your pocket, so you will definitely need that. Um, you are gonna need something to cut your existing downspout with if you're going to be hooking it up to your downspout. So a jigsaw um, or a similar type of saw would work very well for that and, and go through it very easily. Um, some other items that you might need would be um, small amounts of window screen, you might need waterproof adhesive. Chances are, if you're gonna be um, utilizing that window screen, you're gonna need that waterproof adhesive uh, to adhere it to your parts. And a four inch plus diameter hose clamp is not a bad idea too. And some other possible accessories that you could add onto your rain barrel um, would be a rain barrel diverter. If you like um, gadgets, this is not a bad thing to have. Once your rain barrel is full, this will prevent um, overflow from happening and will divert it off um, where you want to have that water go. Um, it's not absolutely necessary because it'll kind of do it on its own anyway, but um, you, you could definitely um, get one of these if you're interested. Additional hoses that you can hook up um, for some of that overflow is a really good idea. That way you're able to get that overflow out away from your foundation more and direct the overflow into areas of your landscape. So the additional hoses are, are a really good idea. You can also hook up soaker hoses to it as well, um, letting out that, that really small volume of, of water when you need it. Um, and of course the gutter filter, like I mentioned before, is a good accessory to think about. And of course, if you're going to be attaching multiple barrels, you're gonna be getting a, a, quite a few pieces of PVC to attach those together. 
and keep out those mosquitoes. Um, it's always a good idea to make sure that you cover every possible access point with fine window screen. Um, it'll also help to filter out the smaller particulate, the sediment that will invariably make its way through your pipe. Um, you don't want that in your barrel, it'll clog your barrel. So it's, it's a win-win, it keeps that stuff out as well as um, preventing mosquitoes from laying their eggs in the water. And you can attach that with that waterproof adhesive and a hose clamp just to be on the safe side, just to make sure you keep it in place. And you wanna really consider where you're going to want to place this thing because it would be, it's not a huge deal to have to move one, but you know, why do it twice if you don't have to? So pick a good spot um, and make sure that your HOA is okay with where you put it. Like I mentioned, it's probably best to plan on putting it in the backyard if you have an HOA. And connecting your rain barrel to the existing downspout. There's many ways to do this. They're doing this with a, a rigid one here and it looks like they have a flexible piece on the end here. Um, that's one combination of, of items you can use to do it. Um, you want to make sure you, you cut that downspout at the exact location that it should be cut. Measure twice, cut once, that old adage. Um, but there are definitely a variety of, of ways to do that. And as I mentioned, this is what those flexible guys look like. So they're available in different colors and different sizes so um, and these stretch out quite a bit um, so you can generally find what you're looking for um, and usually they have um, options for different size diameter holes that you can use on both ends and if you don't have gutters, I've heard people say that, well, their builder just doesn't believe in gutters, so their house doesn't have gutters. So that's no problem. Um, if you don't have gutters, you probably do have waterfall areas, we like to call them, where a lot of water will um, come cascading off. So you can actually, in that case, utilize an open top rain barrel. So in this case, you would be taking that, that jigsaw <laughs> and cutting the whole top of it off completely. And then you would be using your fine window screen and using that waterproof adhesive to glue that down around the edges really well. And you don't want to just stuff there for sure. You want to then do the extra step of getting the chicken wire nice heavy gauge chicken wire and actually screwing that down into the plastic. That way um, you won't find any unfortunate animals that might have fallen in there. Um, this will keep everything out. Um, so definitely if you're, if you're going to have an open top you want to do both of these things, the chicken wire as well as the screen. So that'll capture all of that that big waterfall of water, and then you can use that water how you want to. Also, they make these really pretty decorative rain chains now. So a rain chain can be added to a situation like that. You can hook up a rain chain right here and have that go straight down. And they're, they're quite pretty. And they make nice little tinkling noises in the rain. Um, if you're gonna use the rain chain, um, you definitely want to use it with something like this, with a top like this. Um, you can also hook up um, rain chains to, you know, like the top of a tree. I have mine hooked up to the top of a tree with a big funnel at the top, and it, it actually works really well, too. Um, so um, just always remember that screen, though. Always think mosquitoes and always think of that screen. So what do you do with all that overflow? Well, you wanna make sure that the overflow does not flow directly off of that barrel down into your foundation area. So you want to install some simple PVC pipes near the top of the rain barrel, and you can attach a hose to come off of that and just drain it far away from the house. Um, in this case, these people have the two barrels 
and they have their overflow actually with um, going down into pipes that are buried underground and the, the underground water gets carried out away from the house several feet. And here's where this person has a couple of hose attachments and they have a nice overflow corrugated hose as well for their overflow. Um, so these are some other ideas um, that you can use. And of course the screens again um, will prevent pets and random wildlife as well as small children from falling in. So um, can't stress the importance with an open rain barrel for safety. You definitely want to have that chicken wire screwed down. Um, also, uh, remember that stable heavy duty base, absolutely imperative for, for safety. When it comes to painting your rain barrel, you're probably going to want to paint it. Um, it is, it's kind of a nice shade of blue that they come in. So uh, if you're okay with that, then you can just leave it that blue. That's fine. Um, if you end up ever um, getting one and it happens to be more opaque or white, then you're definitely going to want to paint that because that will become an algae problem. Um, if any amount of sunlight is allowed to get in there, it's, it's going to turn algaed. Um, so then you would definitely want to paint it. So you can, you always want to clean it first before you paint it. So um, a, a clean rag soaked in a solution of one part vinegar to one part water. And you can use a fine to medium grade sandpaper to rough up the surface of the barrel and that helps the paint to adhere to the plastic. Um, and then wipe it down to remove any fine plastic shavings. And you can apply a coat of outdoor primer, allow it to dry, and then you can use outdoor acrylics and you can do some of these really pretty creative paintings on there. Um, and you can also just spray paint it. And they do make spray paint that is made for plastic. So make sure if you're gonna spray paint it alone um, that you're buying one that is specifically for plastic. Um, and then once you're finished, finish it off with one or two coats of a polyurethane, polyurethane clear coat, and you should be good for many, many years. If you don't do all of those steps, you may find that you're going to have some cracking and peeling off and some other issues that you really don't want to deal with. Um, so make sure that you do take the time if you're going to be doing a paint job to, to do it the right way. Here's a case where someone painted their rain barrel the exact same color as their house to help it blend in, to help appease their HOA. <laughs> um, so that's certainly an option. It really does help it to blend in. Um, you can get really, really creative. Obviously, these people are pretty high level artists here. <laughs> um, so uh, it's possible to have a really beautiful rain barrel. Um, always remember that rain barrel uh, water is not drinkable for pets or humans. So definitely don't let your, your dog or your cat have water from your rain barrel and, and certainly not your children. Um, it's not considered potable water. It's, it's non-potable water. You're not supposed to drink in it. You're not supposed to wash in it. So no personal use here. It can definitely contain and bacteria and of course the longer it sits the, the more dangerous it can become. Um, so what what uses will this water have? It's not just for watering plants you can actually use it to wash your cars and your boat with. You can use it to of course water your plants either by hand or you can hook it up to a drip irrigation system that's a very good use for it. Um, you can hook up those, um, the overflow pipes and direct them to areas of the landscape that need more frequent water, as long as they're well away from your foundation. Um, remember, it, it can go stagnant, so um, try to use that water and empty the barrel within a week after a rain event. 
you can use it to clean your garden tools before you bring them inside. Just make sure you dry them very well too before you put them away or they'll rust. Um, and because it, it can definitely contain bacteria, you want to use it if you're watering edible plants with it. Make sure you only water the root zone um, down in the soil and don't get it onto the leaves or the fruit of your edible plants. Here is the information for purchasing your rain barrel from the Manatee County Rain Barrel Program. And this is for Manatee County residents only, unfortunately, if you're watching from outside of the county, um, you, you will not be able to buy a, a rain barrel from Manatee County. But look into your own county government um, website and call around maybe and, and you know, to departments and, and see if you can get your own through your county. Um, these are our barrels that are used um, with food grade um, chemicals that are used to treat our water supply. So um, the, the county is kind of constantly generating these, these barrels um, as part of their treatment program. So um, this is the number that you'd want to call. It's 941-792-8811. And the extension is 5327. Or you can email them at water.saver at mymanatee.org. And I'll leave that up for just a few minutes. If anybody wants to take a picture of it, you are welcome to do that. Um, for anyone who's registered for this, you will be able to access this presentation uh, later on once, um, once we end up emailing it out to you, um, so you can refer back to it then as well. Okay, so do you already have a Florida-friendly yard? If you're following all of the nine principles, um, you probably do have a Florida-friendly yard already. So if you would like to be recognized and get assigned for your yard, please contact me at sjgriffith at ufl.edu and myself and a cohort of master gardeners will come out and visit you once we're allowed to do that again and bring you a lovely Florida friendly landscaping sign for your front yard and make a big fuss over you for all of the wonderful things that you've done with your yard. Well, we thank you very much for your time today and for your efforts to conserve water and to reduce stormwater runoff. And for more information, please contact us at the Manatee County Extension Office. Or if you have any horticulture questions at all, um, you can email myself or manateemg at gmail.com and you will get some very knowledgeable master gardeners who will help you figure out any problems that you might be having and they can help with plant ID as well. We're here to help you. Anything plant related, anything environmentally related, we're here to help you. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much and have a great day. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody again. I really appreciate you logging in today to the webinar. Um, let's see, we have a few things in the Q&A. <clears throat> um, questions about <clears throat> how much Manatee County charges for their rain barrel kit. They charge, I believe it's $30. And if you have an account with them already, then you should be able to use a credit card. If you don't, then you'll have to call that number and, and get some instructions on what you can do to get it. They're doing some social distancing measures in order to try to get it to you. So they'll, they'll come up with some sort of a, a workaround. <laughs> okay, and then a question about City of Bradenton, if that's available um, for folks to get a, a barrel if they live in the city limits. Um, call them and ask them. Um, I, re I really am not sure. Um, as far as I know from what their website says, you have to be a Manatee County resident, but I'm not sure how, how, you know, 
severely they're, you know, <laughs> taking that definition. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thanks everybody so much and have a wonderful day. I really appreciate you logging into the webinar today. Thank you.